Welcome to Equine Euthanasia and End-of-Life Options, a Veterinary Roundtable presented by the Maryland Equine Transition Service, a program of the Maryland Horse Council Foundation. Please be sure to watch all four parts. Kind of go off what Dr. Gardner just mentioned, how do you as vets, all four of you, how do you handle the emotional aspect um, whether it's an animal that you've been treating for years in your practice, or maybe you've been called out for an emergent case, um, what are the things that you do to protect yourselves from, because every single one has to be traumatic to you on some level. So what are some ways that you are able to, to handle with this kind of darker side of your practice? Um, for me, I feel that euthanasia is a gift that is not allowed uh, to most people and that I am upholding my veterinarian's oath to uh, relieve suffering. And it may be difficult, but if I euthanize an animal for whatever reason, whether it be mental suffering or physical suffering, that that's a gift that um, a physician is not allowed to have. And I, uh, I appreciate and see each one as a, a gift to that animal. That's just my way of thinking, but that's how I deal with it, that I'm able to do something for this animal to help it, to help it. Yeah, I certainly look at it as a relief of suffering, right? And if I'm euthanizing the animal 95% of the time, it's for good reason. And whether that's founder or colic or, or, or an emergency of some sort that we can't remedy. So <clears throat> I feel blessed to be able to do it. And that makes me feel good about the procedure. Yeah, there's a certain need to accept the inevitable, but, you know, our, our basic job is to fix things and make things better. And a lot of euthanasias go along with feelings of um, failure and um, not having uh, done everything that you could, even though you did. So... Um, you know, I, I think it's uh, it's emotionally wrenching, and that's an aspect to it. And then there's also the aspect of empathizing with clients who are often your friends uh, with their loss. Um, that I mean, there there are some that are definitely easier than others. The the flopping leg is a a no brainer, but. Um, there are some that are, are definitely wrenching, and I confess I've shed a few tears in the process of doing them. Um, if I may, I, I, oh, I definitely cry also. I cry a lot, <laughs> even if it's the first time that I've met them. And, and often with, with our organization, we, we exclusively do end-of-life care. So we're, we're going to the homes, and, and we will typically do about 60 appointments a month, which is, which is high volume for any veterinarian to do. So, uh, and a lot of people ask us, you know, are you emotionally tapped? Are you, you know, compassion fatigued and things like that? And I always say, heck no, we're not compassion fatigued. We have compassion. That's why we're doing this. Um, sadly, about 50% of pets that are small animal pets that are euthanized in clinics have not been to their general doctor in over a year. And, and when I go to homes, and that's the same thing in the home, these pets have not been to their veterinarian at least 50%. I, I struggle with that. Like that, I'm like, uh, what we could have we could have made this last year better. We might not have extended the length, but we could have gotten the quality better. That's what bothers me. Um, and so my, my priority in, in, as a veterinarian now is educating vets on geriatrics and what we could do for our geriatric pets. Uh, but I always say, it, I, may not, I may not be able to control why I'm doing this euthanasia, right? Like if, it, if it's a, a cat in, in, with diabetes and the owners can't afford insulin and I could, but I can't take any more cat, doesn't matter. Like I, I'm still going to do this. So I may not be able to control why, but I can control how. And I can control how I describe everything to the pet I, or to the owner. I can control, you know, how I help them assess quality of life. I can, I can control the process and making sure that they, you know, in, in our world are sedated, are really, you know, very peaceful and relaxed, that the owner's got, you know, the emotional support they need and, and do it well. And, 
And when I leave, even, even something as small as I, as a veterinarian, will do every single paw impression in clay in front of the owner. I want to do it right then and there so they have something at that moment to take with them. And I believe even, even you know, horse lovers would love something then, you know, a, a clipping of, of mane and things like that. And, and it, it takes their mind away from grief to a little smile sometimes. And if I can get that, and if I can, you know, without a pandemic, get a hug, <laughs> it's, it helps me. Um, and so I'm very satisfied that I can provide such an amazing goodbye. And to everybody's point, it is a gift that we have in veterinary medicine. It doesn't make it any easier for, you know, for the owner. I, I just euthanized my own dog last Sunday and um, it's horrible. I, I, you know, medically rocked that euthanasia. Like it was the best one ever, but emotionally still was hard. And, uh, and, but it helps me to know that she went perfectly in at home and I think with, with a lot of you, you, you are connected maybe even more to your owners than, than we are in, in, in small animal. Because you go to their, their farms, you go to their homes, you're, you're talking to them maybe more in the middle of the night. And you might have a different connection. And so I, uh, you know, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful connection to have with our families. And, and to your point, I think it's okay to cry too and, and be a part of that. I know a lot of new vets ask me, oh, is it unprofessional to cry? And, and I always say, you know, uh, a lack of empathy is, is, is as vulgar as an excess of tears. So, <laughs> so to show so shum is, is okay. Just don't outdo the owner. <laughs> to, to your point, Dr. Gardner, I, uh, we have a little bag, little uh, net bag that we cut hair and we also have some information on there where they can get horse hair memorials. Nice. And so we'll cut some of the horse hair tail Put it in there and leave the bag with them and they can decide later if they want to you know send that they have the information right there on a little piece of paper and it yeah, i think it it helps because some it people does. you ask them and they don't they don't know at that time that they want that but here it is it's done you know tastefully and and Beautiful. i think they people have appreciated that for sure there was an amusing cartoon of uh, a bunch of horses in heaven all looking at each other wondering why they were all missing a piece of their tail <laughs> Oh, I'm going to need to have that. I love it. <laughs> it's, um, the shorter your tail, the more you were loved or something like that. I think that's oh, what <laughs> oh, I got goosebumps. I love that. <laughs> yeah, those are really great points. And I think it is something, you know, like, like you guys said, like in the human world, doctors aren't able to help people pass with dignity like we're able to help our animals do. And it is such a beautiful thing. To be able to do that, you know, um, Dr. Gardner, I'm sorry you had to put your yeah. dog down. It's uh, hard. It you is. Know, as, as, as you guys were mentioning, the, the floppy leg, which which I'm assuming is a mobility issue. Uh, <laughs> we don't have that in, in dogs. Uh, but it is also sometimes different depending on the disease that the pet has. So if you've got one where, you know, they're they're not eating and they're, and they're you know, sick and feeling, you know, cruddy... <laughs> Sometimes, or in heart heart failure for me is, is or anything with respiratory distress to me is is like I want to do this faster, like sooner than later. And sometimes owners are are better with that because they they see the pet really sick. Mobility is a hard one, and that was for me. My girl had spinal lymphoma, and it was her mobility that was her issue, and she was just happy and fine except for her little her floppy legs. <laughs> yeah, and, and it was tough. Um. We actually, off that, we had a couple questions. Um, let, let me pull one of our questions. So um, here's a specific one from somebody named Joni. I'm um, talking about how you know when it's time to euthanize your equine. And I think a lot of these um, are also probably applicable in the small animal world, Dr. Gardner. But um, Joni says, if day-to-day -day life activities are difficult or painful, I would say quality of life have reached a point where euthanasia is in order. However, what about for a horse that is fine some days, but in pain other days? How can you measure that is an, enough is enough when the majority of days are fine and the horse is thriving, eating well, and apparently enjoying life? For background, I'm asking about a horse with head shaking syndrome, which causes nerve pain in the face. Currently it's controlled with gabapentin, but gabapentin becomes less effective over time. I am exploring other medication options as well. So in a case like that, how do how can an owner know when it's time to euthanize and to to stop that suffering when it's just a day here a day there 
Dr. Callahan, how would you answer that? Well, I think that, um, you know, horses like to do certain things. They like to eat, they like to sleep, they like to walk around. And when those qualities that they can't do that in the majority of the time, you know, I would not say that one day or two days of head shaking is going to interfere with that horse eating, um, walking, or, you know, sleeping. But when it gets to the point where those basic physical activities are uh, impacted, it can't eat, it can't, you know, it can't maintain weight, it can't walk around because it's got chronic laminitis, it's in pain all the time. I think that's where I would say, you know, when it's interfering with those basic life activities, um, that that would be time to start considering whether A, in her case, are there other options? And yes, there may be for head shaking, or B, is it time for euthanasia? And I think I'm not sure how everybody else feels about that. I would basically agree with that. I, I think sometimes um, clients are overly concerned in eliminating absolutely any suffering. Um, and I think in chronic situations, the horses will tell you when enough is enough, when they stop interacting with you and with their owners and uh, other horses and stop eating. Uh, those are the, the big signs. Well, I thought about this question quite a bit and, and a few years ago, I tried to create a little bit of a quality of life scale and some of that I, I found from Dr. Mary Gardner and, and then tried to apply it a little bit to the horse. And I know um, Mets and Katie Whipple have also helped to adjust that a bit as well because it's always a constant evolution of quality of life and certainly I think Dr. Redu said something in respect to certain people may have a different feeling about what quality of life is and so numerically putting a number on this sometimes is difficult but a lot of the information I think has come from the human side as well where they have some scales and I'm sure Dr. Gardner has some thoughts on that but we try to apply it right to the horse and certainly I look at the horse and I think mobility is probably the most important thing certainly in a dog or cat maybe a dog you can put them in a wheelchair or, or some sort of mobile device right well we can't do that in a horse at all um, and so for me mobility is really really important followed by some of those other important physical activities of, of nutrition or eating or hydration and elimination and certainly her behavior attitude um, and just even just simply looking at heart rate and whether or not you have to give medications and all of these things kind of combine together help me give a little bit of quality of life and i've given out quality of life scales that i've prepared if you will to clients to try to help them gauge maybe a little bit about the number of good days versus bad days and trying to put a little bit of a numerical value on it as as a veterinarian i like numerics if you will but we still have to also understand what the heart says a bit and, and try to incorporate that into our quality of life discussion oh boy uh, it too oh no go ahead uh i i have a hard time because this is my this is my like favorite topic of all so <laughs> um and it's it is really not very different in in the small animal space and uh and I think what's, I, I was like writing some notes because I can talk for an hour on quality life. This is our number one question. I think every every animal hospital, small to large, should have information on their website about assessing quality of life because it is the number one trafficked page on our website because people want to people know. And, and there'll be somebody flippantly in their life just saying, don't worry, you'll know. And, and sometimes you do. And I think in horses, they, there is a, is, there's some magic that, that with them. <laughs> um, but, but sometimes if you're waiting for a look and you're waiting to know for sure you are waiting from active suffering to be present and there is a wonderful place called denial island that many of us are residents of during this time and you may not see it so i love i love scales and to dr spoda your point like sometimes numerics is weird about this but you could but you could soften it right and so it is it's just a guide to help you and um I always say, I want to make a joys of living list. Like what makes this horse, this horse, every horse, every dog, every cat has a different personality, right? And what makes Rusty, Rusty? And, and when they're not doing those things, then it's definitely a certain quality of life issue. 
you know, eating and, and mobility is massive for, for any animal. Uh, the bigger, the bigger, the worse it is, right? I had a harness for my girl. I'm not going to harness a horse. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's a massive issue. But um, something I, I, I love to do is with those quality of life scales is not just say more good days than bad. It's, it's what is the percentage? Is it 30% good or is it 70% good that you want? It's not just 50, 50 sometimes, right? So to, to your point, you know, Dr. Callahan, like one or two head, head shaking days is not so bad or, you know, but, but 50% or more that maybe that's it. And also what is a good day and what is a bad day? And I actually define and, and put words behind that is, you know, are, are they not eating all of their, their food? Like whatever it may be, um, uh, you know, I'm trying to use obviously examples for the equine space, but for us is, you know, do they sleep through the whole night or four, four hours is good. Right? Like, you know, did they have one accident in the house or is there, you know, pee all over and, and, you know, feces all over? Not, not good. So you have to define what is good or bad because everyone in the household, everyone in the farm may, may have different belief systems on, on what is good or bad. And that helps families come together, especially when there's husband and wives or partners or whatever, and they have to make a decision together. Um, and one thing that is really important to consider with quality of life is also caregiver fatigue and caregiver quality of life. And that could be massive. You don't know what's going on in their, in their own lives. You don't know all the issues that they've got to deal with. For me, I, you know, I wasn't sleeping for months, for months, not sleeping through the night, sleeping on a couch next to my girl, waking up early to make sure, you know, she was clean and good and, you know, moving. And, and so it's a lot caring for a terminal or, or geriatric pet. So for me, anytime I have Anytime I have a terminal illness or a very, a very old geriatric pet, I say you are in a subjective time period, also known as the roller coaster. And you're gonna have good days, bad days, you know, hills, you're gonna be ready to pull the cord and get off at any time. Um, at any time when you're in my subjective time period, which starts today, you know, with this conversation, I support your decision to say goodbye at any time and not let them feel bad if they wanna keep going a little bit. Now there's going to become, there is going to come a time where I'm going to talk you off this ledge because we need to help this pet. But until then, I'm going to support your decision. Make sure palliation is important. And I think that that's good for all size creatures. Absolutely. I think that brings us really nicely into another question from Janet, um, kind of thinking about your point. Sometimes owners are going to be on that denial island. Um, but Janet asks, is it ever a veterinarian's place to suggest to the owner that it's time to let go? I'm not thinking of catastrophic injury or inoperable conditions, more of a horse whose quality of life is poor or surgery with a low chance of success. And I will answer yes, that I have told, I have told owners that I felt that it was that they need to consider euthanasia. Um, again, uh, my oath was to prevent animal suffering. And if I feel that an animal is suffering, that is, I'm certainly, I don't make that decision, but I will tell them that I feel that for this X and X reasons, that I feel that they should consider euthanasia. No, I certainly recommended euthanasia, if you will, in the sense of quality of life or, or understanding the circumstance. And certainly owners want our professional opinion, I think, oftentimes. So certainly some do not, but a lot of times I think they <laughs> Want a professional opinion. We've seen this multiple times. Where is this leading? How is this going? Certainly understanding our diagnostics and, and our, our veterinary skills, trying to utilize those to, to ultimately decide, you know, the outcome is poor. You know, people want to know that before it gets to that very poor situation. I'll let Dr. Adu. Yeah, no, I I have in instances recommended it, probably uh, not all that often. I have a very conscientious clientele that um, uh, are more likely to, to bring it up to me without prompting. There, T can uh, speak to this as well. There is a newly changed uh, regulation in the um, laws regulating veterinarians that states that uh, it's uh, 
a punishable violation to uh, allow abuse to continue uh, without intervening um, or reporting it if it comes to that. Uh, so we, we have a legal as well as moral obligation to, to do something. So that means that if you recommend euthanasia um, and the owner does nothing, you're obligated to report to animal control? Is that what that regulation means? Um, yes, I would say that individual circumstances might modify that. But, uh, but yes, if push came to shove, I think that's what it means. I, I think what Dr. Radu, if we see an animal that is suffering or an intractable pain, that the owner um, does not, if we consider it abuse to the point where that horse is suffering and the owner will not um, make steps to uh, treat that condition or the condition can't be treated, then we do have a legal um, responsibility to report that to animal control. So, and you know, and that's very rare. It's not that if I consider euthanasia or I tell the owner, I think they should euthanize and I'm gonna report them to animal control. But if I see an animal that's actively suffering and I consider it abuse that's starving to death because it isn't being fed or has chronic laminitis and can't walk or bear weight on one leg, uh, I have a, an obligation to report that. So it's not that uh, any animal that I feel that, sh you know, that the owner should consider euthanasia, I'm going to report. But if I see an animal that I feel is abuse, it's an abuse situation, I can report it. Yeah, I think like I do, uh, they, we, we get most people asking for it, obviously, but I do think sometimes it's very helpful to bring it up with owners. They, they don't want to mention this word. They don't want to do this. They, you know, and, and just, you know, gently and, and compassionately, also confidently, though, bringing this up as an option. Um, sometimes they feel like they're a failure if they, you know, they don't want to tell you because you've been working so long with them and hard on something. And, and uh, I think it's, it's really helpful to have this kind, compassionate conversation with them. Let them know that you support their, you know, support them either way until it gets to be the, you know, like what you guys were saying with you. But, uh, you know, we have the benefit of, of a lot of sedation and pain management because they can just be, you know, a little cat can be curled up in a sunbeam. And I can highly, you know, medicate them like we do in humans. That's, that is hospice, end of life hospice with, with humans is, is massive, massive drugs, which you can't do with horses necessarily, right? Because they have to be mobile. Um, but anyway, to the, back to the point that I absolutely will bring it up if I think it is an option. And, uh, and most families are fine. Once in a while, we'll get the person like, how dare you <laughs> bring this up? But it is, it is my oath. Here's a good uh, saying I usually, I usually say, I, I know you don't want Rusty to suffer. He's struggling though, really hard. And if we let him go, he'll never suffer. And owners like, like they kind of like that because then they realize that, you know, letting them go, I always say, you know, a week too soon and a day too late, those, those sayings, which are very helpful. But um, right, if we, if we don't, nobody wants suffering. And, and uh, so that's why if, it's, if you're on the fence and we don't know, and I like to bring up and say, he's struggling though right now, and I don't want him to ever suffer. And wouldn't you agree? And saying things like that, wouldn't you agree? And you know, to get them over the line is, is all really helpful. That is um, important. We bring it up at every assessment we go to. We talk to owners about euthanasia, even if the horse is down and you know, obviously not a candidate, we talk about it, if for nothing else to make it the word euthanasia, which is kind of a little taboo, um, to make it more of a part of the conversation. You know, if it's not a part of the conversation, then it remains something that's difficult to talk about. And when the time comes, then we do end up being a day too late with the euthanasia and the animal is suffering needlessly. Whereas if it, if it becomes more of a part of the regular conversation, then maybe the public at large will be better at recognizing those signs a week early and yeah. is better prepared to deal with it. Uh, an observation on the quality of life issue. I, I think horse owners are often 
guilty of overestimating how much the horse values uh, their interaction. The you know the storyline is the you know my horse loves to work, and if he can't you know go to a horse show every weekend, he's not going to be happy, sort of thing. And you know those horses are would be perfectly happy out in a right. grassy paddock, not being bugged for the rest of their life. Right. Listen, I I'm happy not doing all the things I did when I was 20, right? Like it's, it's okay. We don't have to be the stallions for their, for our lifetime. I do think one of the things though, that we haven't discussed that we see more in horses is the economic aspect of um, horse care and euthanasia. Oh yeah. Because, you know, um, that owner may, cannot find a home or a suitable home for that horse. That's got some type of uh, debilitating disease um, and you know that they're expensive to keep, and um, I, I think that that's a little difficult. You know, I I personally would much rather euthanize a horse and see it go to an unknown uh, fate in an auction house or a slaughterhouse or something like that. And it's that's very difficult for people. I feel a lot of people have uh, don't want to euthanize their animals. They'll send it off and think it's going to get a good home. And um, you know, this is why Mets was formed, really, because. There, there's a lot of time. There's no good home at the end of that. Yeah, I that's think literally the line I use is, "We would rather this beautiful, healthy animal be humanely euthanized than potentially end up in the auction pipeline, um, where its fate is unknown and probably going to be really awful." Um, that's literally the line we use. Um, so, what are what are some things that we can do to help people understand that? You know. I can talk about it all day long. We can talk about, about it all day long. How do we get it to be more accepted that that is a preferable outcome for a horse who is a rideable or a healthy horse where we can find a, an appropriate home for them? I tell people that the things that are worse than death, and yeah. that would be one of them. Um, and that, you know, if I put your your horse to sleep that we can't find a home for or whatever that you at least you know it went peacefully and quietly and in a familiar surroundings but i have seen some of these horses i have i've seen horses in places that are worse than death and um i you know i i firmly believe that um uh, like just like dr gardner was saying better a week too early than a day too late and i think that that's a that's a that's going to be a societal taboo um, we've taught that, you know, life is precious and that all, uh, you know, that, that, that we should be maintaining that. And I think that that's going to be, it's going to be, it, I don't know if you'll ever in this particular society, and I'm talking about, um, uh, you know, North American society or whatever, I'm not necessarily religious, but it's, it's very difficult for people to um, have that time. And I don't know whether you'll, any of us in our lifetime will be able to convince people of that. It's our belief system. I think it's a Christian belief system, and I think it's it, it would be very difficult. But it it I firmly believe it. One of the the other things that we talk about with our owners is controlling the fate. You know, you can control the fate of your animal while it's in your care. Once once it's out of, off your farm, you don't have any control over that fate anymore. Um, so that's just one other thing that we um, talk to people about. I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna, I don't know about this auction world. I'm going to have to look into this because now I'm like, I'm, yeah. this is a, this is a sad. It breaks my heart to, to, yeah. to, to know this. You know, what's interesting though, is even in our field, sometimes veterinarians are, are anti-euthanizing some pets. And I've run across that in, in many of my lectures and I'll talk about a healthy, 12 year old golden, you know, that's just been diagnosed with lymphoma and showing no signs. And I say, I will euthanize them. And, and I've gotten negative feedback from veterinarians that are like, how dare you? The pet is okay. And I said, my oath is to prevent suffering from happening. And if I do it sooner than later, then I, not saying I would do it. My girl, Sam, she was, she was like, I had radiation. I did chemo. I did everything. It's not saying what I would do, but I would also help an owner that that can't financially care for their pet. There, I always say there are four budgets to caring for an animal. Monetary is one one, and that is big, especially with, with the larger the animal. I mean, Sam was expensive and she was a big girl. 
there's the physical budget, the, the time budget is massive and the, and, the, and the emotional budget. And if any of them are up, I support the decision to say goodbye because where else are they going to go? Unless you know for sure that you're finding a good home and this you know, happens a lot with aggressive animals for us and uh, you know, and I'm, mental illness is still an illness. But it's, I think it's, it's taboo a little bit also in the veterinary space. And, um, and I think uh, it's just a good topic to bring up and, and be non-judgmental to the families and to the, and to the, and to the veterinarians that, that perform it. And I, but I've gotten beat up a little bit. And that's when I say, well, did you have a steak for dinner? Because you must euthanize healthy animals to eat them. And we're okay with that, but we're not okay taking a, you know, a, an animal that will be suffering soon in some manner and not, and not doing it well. So I can get on a soapbox on that one. <laughs> I'll, so I'll step down. <laughs> My personal checklist when I find myself tending towards being judgmental about people euthanizing for financial issues is, you know, whether I would adopt the horse and take care of him for the next 10 years. Right. And usually the answer is no. Um, Correct. I, and you guys got longer too. Yeah. We don't have like 20, 30 years. No, we got 40, 30, yeah. 40. Yeah. And big. <laughs> and big. That's a great one, Dr. Yeah. That's a really good way of looking at it, Dr. Radio. Thank you for watching. Please be sure to watch the other installments of this roundtable. Also, please consider donating to keep METS a part of Maryland's equine community. Let us know if you'd like to see a roundtable about any other subjects. Thank you very much and have a great day.